Good morning, my name is Samantha Dykstra, and I'll be reading today's scripture, which comes from the Gospel of Luke. Before we read it, I want to pray for us. Lord God, thank you for giving us the Bible. Thank you that through reading it, we can learn more about you and learn to love you more. Send your spirit to help us understand your word and to help us grow. For Jesus' sake, amen. Now hear the word of the Lord from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, starting in the first verse. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to, the word, said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Exactly. So before I get into the story, I just want to cover real quick, if you wonder aloud, if you know what the verb flag means. Most of us know what a flag is, you know, uh, for a country or a college or whatever it happens to be. Um, but the verb to flag, I wonder if you know what that means. It means, to, uh, it has to do with what it looks like when a flag is just draped, when it's not uh, up in the wind, but when it's just sort of fallen below, the to flag is to be kind of sort of weak and crumbling. Um, that's going to come up later. So, Jesus entered Jericho. That's how the passage starts. Jesus entered Jericho. Never mind you that it was earlier in this gospel, this same gospel, when somebody asked, Who is my neighbor? And Jesus' reply was that a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Jerusalem to Jericho. When he was attacked by robbers and two men, one a priest and one a Levite, passed by on the other side. When one man, a Samaritan, went out of his way to help the beaten man who was on his way to Jericho. Jesus entered Jericho and he was passing through. In other words, he had no intention to stop, no plans to stay a while in Jericho. He was passing through. And at this point, we're pretty far removed from him being the baby born in Bethlehem. He's uh, nearing the end of his earthly journey. So right after this, he's going to enter in to Jerusalem and be crucified. But he's on his way. He's passing through Jericho and he's become quite popular and crowds surround him as he's passing through. And we're told of one man in particular who wants to see him. This man's name is Zacchaeus. And we're told two things about Zacchaeus. First is this, that he was a chief tax collector and was wealthy, very wealthy, which is a polite way of saying that he's a crook. The tax collection system wasn't, you know, digital and nameless the way it is for many of us these days with the IRS. It was personal. It was face to face. Somebody would come, knock on your door and say, you owe 10 denarii. And there's a chance, a chance that you actually owe the precise sum of 10 denarii. But if Zacchaeus was a wealthy tax collector and a chief one at that, pretty much everybody knew that you probably owed something more like six, seven, eight, not 10. And that Zacchaeus was pocketing the difference. And there's one reason why, that's one of many reasons why when Zacchaeus was probably walking down the streets of Jericho, people probably passed by 
on the other side. Second thing we learn about Zacchaeus is that he was short. He was short. It's a rare thing for the Gospels to give us a physical description of one of the characters in these stories. For instance, we know next to nothing about the physical characteristics of Jesus himself. Was he 6'4 and lanky? Was he 5'8 and stocky? We literally have no idea, despite what he might look like on some crucifix you've seen, despite the Swedish man you've seen in some paintings, We literally have no idea. Likewise, we have no physical description for Mary, Joseph, Magi, Peter, and a whole host of others. But we know a little something about Zacchaeus. He was short. Short enough that in a crowd of people, he wasn't even tall enough as a grown man to see Jesus who might be walking by on the street. So he was short, which only exacerbates the stereotype we have in our heads of this sniveling little crafty, cunning ripoff artist of a tax collector. Yet this sniveling little crafty, conniving ripoff artist wanted to see who Jesus was. He wanted to see who Jesus was, which um, fails to indicate his precise motive. Was he caught up in the buzz and just wanted to see this popular figure who was gathering crowds? Maybe there were other short people or young children who wanted to climb up that tree and Zacchaeus was just selfish enough that he wasn't going to let that happen. He was going to have that little perch. Or maybe the Holy Spirit prompted him to climb that tree. To go to extraordinary lengths to get a view of this man. A man who is different than all the other men around Jericho. Either way, he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see Jesus since Jesus was coming that way. And Jesus, who was passing through, reached the spot where Zacchaeus was perched in a sycamore tree. And we have to imagine that when Jesus stopped and opened his mouth to speak, the crowds were probably giddy with anticipation of how Jesus might give Zacchaeus some version of holy hell. After all, it was just before this, as recorded in Luke 18, right before he comes to Jericho, that he spoke to another rich man and instructed him, saying, sell everything you have and give it to the poor, which made that man very sad. Indeed, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. That's the least, the very least the crowds might have expected in this situation, some version of bad news. What Jesus actually says is, Zacchaeus, come down here immediately. I'm staying at your house today. Wait, what? The mob is quick to mutter, he has gone to be a guest of a sinner. Which on its face is no more than a factual statement. They're not wrong. Yet, it's not much of a leap to discern that their mutterings are full of astonished misgivings. And Luke gives us no indication of Jesus' immediate response to those mutterings, those misgivings. We can only surmise that his silence was deafening. And into that auditory void... Steps Zacchaeus. Something's come over him. And we're not given the timeline, but it seems that they have now made it to his house because Luke tells us that he stood up. He stood up, all five foot nothing of that sniveling little conniving ripoff artist. And he said, Look, Lord, 
Here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Half to the poor, four times the amount to anybody that he's cheated. One wonders if he'll have anything left after that. One wonders if he'll even follow through. One wonders... And before one can wonder any further, Jesus proclaims a word over those wonderings. Today, salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. This guy? The crowds, not for the first time nor the last, are left reeling, gasping. What? What? I think you've lost the trail here, Jesus. You you were supposed to just be passing through and now you've clearly gone astray. This man is an outcast and even if he did what he said he was going to do, he would still have some serious work to do to build up trust in this community again. Son of Abraham, one of us, you can't be serious. Indeed, he could hardly be more serious. This is what Frederick Beekner calls the un... Whoop, where did it go? Come on, oh, sad. I thought I had a slide for it, but this is what Frederick Beekner calls the unflagging lunacy of God. The unflagging lunacy of God. In other words, the untiring never weakening, not under any condition diminishing lunacy of God. In other words, the point of this story is not that we might think better of Zacchaeus, a man whose testimony is quite remarkable, a man who was a crook and allowed God to straighten out his crooked ways. A man whose faith is worth emulation as he follows prompts, follows prompts from God to climb a tree, follows prompts from God to radically alter his finances, his very life. It's certainly worth paying attention to Zacchaeus. But the ultimate point of the story is to pay attention to the unflagging lunacy of God. The untiring, never weakening, not under any condition condition diminishing lunacy of God. Because here's a man whose sheer depravity has ostracized him from the community. And everything human within us wants to side with the crowd in thinking that he has earned his place outside the community. And that he deserves everything he's got coming to him. But in the divine order of things, his sheer depravity comes face to face with the unflagging lunacy of God's grace. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. How lost? Lost. Like Zacchaeus lost. Like sniveling, crafty, cunning, rip-off artist lost. And in fact, like the crowds lost. There's no no room in their divine paradigm for Zacchaeus, and that's because they're lost too. Amen? Thankfully, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. In fact, when the Son of Man is on his way to and through Jericho, he's willing to have his plans altered. He's willing to have his life interrupted. He doesn't go by on the other side of the road, but he stops and welcomes because he came to seek and to save the lost. And that whole theme is part of the story of Christmas, that God is willing to be inconvenienced to seek and save people like you and me whether we're part of the crowd or we're Zacchaeus. 
or both. That's the sheer lunacy of God, that our unending foolishness is met with the unrelenting grace of God. That our unceasing sinfulness is met with the unremitting mercy of God. So merciful that he would become enfleshed on our behalf. And so as you and I look toward 2023, I just wonder, I wonder, will we pay attention and believe in the sheer lunacy of God? From our human perspective, the divine economy makes no sense at all. And that's part of the story. That's why the Bible is given to us. Will we believe that God would actually be interrupted for our sake? The same way Jesus was interrupted for Zacchaeus' sake. And in response, will we radically alter our lives like Zacchaeus? And in imitation, will we too participate in that lunacy? Offering up interruptible lives in order to seek and save the lost. Uh, Let's pray. Lord, you've heard all those questions that I've just asked, wondering out loud. I pray that by your Holy Spirit, we would have the capacity to even grasp a little piece of just how insane your grace is and just how far it stretches from the east and the west, just how Deep and long and wide and high is your love. For the Zacchaeus of the world, for us who are Zacchaeus of the world, for the crowds who don't believe that it's that long and high and far and deep, may we be a peculiar people who believe in the sheer lunacy of your grace. And all your people say, Amen.